Hello, everyone. After Packy here, we have another great speaker for you. Uh, we have Mauricio and Olaf uh, with a presentation of Purple on My Mind, cost-effective automated adversary simulation. And with that, uh, I will let them take it away. Thank you very much, guys. All right, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our session. Welcome to the Blue Team Village. Um, uh, we're really excited to be here. This is our first time. Um, thanks to the, all the organizers uh, for all the hard work. My name is Mauricio. I'm Olaf Hartung. Um, and today we're streaming live uh, from the East Coast, myself, 1030 here. And Olaf here is in Europe, where it's 430 AM right now. So I hope that he doesn't fall asleep during our talk. Um, Today we're gonna we're gonna be talking about um, setting up a cost-effective adversary simulation program. Um, first, we're gonna we're gonna go over a quick introduction, um, define the problem statement. Um, then we're gonna talk about uh, adver automated adversary simulation or purple teaming and and kind of describe a methodology and a framework that uh, works for us that we've experienced and we use. Um, we're going to go over the, the um, available tooling to execute this type of uh, uh, engagement. And finally, we're going to talk about, uh, show you the open source tools that we've built um, and now how we've integrated them uh, as a POC, really, for this talk to, uh, to uh, set up a cost-effective adversary simulation program. Um, and we have 20 minutes of demos of these our tools being integrated. So I hope uh, you enjoyed. We ha we had a lot of fun uh, building the demos. So hope you you have fun and and uh, get something out of this. Um, okay, so we'll start real quick uh, with the introductions. Yeah, so my name is Olaf Hartung. Um, I'm based in the Netherlands, uh, where I founded uh, Falcon Force together with a couple of really smart people. And it's a really purple company, so we do a lot of offensive and defensive work, and I'm a defensive specialist there. Um, and I develop quite a lot of open source software, uh, uh, mostly on the defensive uh, spectrum, uh, which you can find on my GitHub page, uh, which is linked over here. Thanks, Olaf. And uh, my name is Mauricio Velasco. Um, I currently lead the threat management team at a financial um, financial services organization of Fortune 500, and my team is responsible for, I mean, among many other things, uh, detection, response, and executing simulations, purple team exercises. Um, in the past years, um, few years, I've done some research um, and developed some tools around threat hunting and detection and adversary simulation. So if you want to check out some of that content, you can do that on my GitHub. Okay. Um, all right, so we'll, we'll start with uh, the introduction. So let's talk about deploying an effective detection program. Um, it's definitely not an easy task, right? I know uh, many of you have probably done it. Uh, we could probably talk hours about uh, setting up a detection program, right? Uh, there's a lot of steps, right? You have to identify um, the relevant telemetry, the data sources that you you need, you think you you need to ingest, right? You need to instrument your environment to basically develop an event pipeline where you're uh, grabbing all this telemetry from your network and your endpoints and sending it to an event pipeline uh, through uh, to an analytics engine where you can query this information and uh, and and start detecting, right? And start creating your own detection logic um, to look for bad, look for suspicious behavior happening on your environment. Um, and this is great. And um, now I was naive at some point after deploying one of these programs uh, where, you know, I thought we're great. We have a detection program. Detections are, are working. We're creating our logic. The alerts are triggering. We're investigating them. But, um, I learned the hard way that um, after you deploy a detection program, which is a challenge by itself, another challenge starts and perhaps more difficult than the one deploying the program. And that is 
we need to maintain this complex balance of tools, process, technology working together. And it's not easy. So many things can go wrong, right? So we need the, to basically deploy controls to measure the effectiveness um, and verify the health status of, uh, of a detection program. We're not thinking about those metrics. We, we need, really need to, start to, uh, need to start thinking about these metrics. Yeah, so I have a long history in consulting and I've built a lot of these detection programs in the past. And usually they're great or even rocking the, the detection. So they're they're building a lot of cool stuff. They're responding to it, as Mauricio also said. And then some of the really mature teams also have a, a real good hunting practice. They do their own research into all kinds of threats that are out there or new techniques that are being applied. However, in most cases, these teams are quite reactive in nature. So they only respond to what is new uh, and they don't always uh, look, look inwards really well. So the, the, more, the more mature teams actually monitor all their incoming log sources, that, but it's not always at the granular level. Usually it's on a system level and then maybe only after a couple of days that, that, that there's no logs incoming. So never on a really short time frame. And as someone responsible like Mauricio or your CISO or, uh, or the lead of a detection team, you might get questions from your stakeholders. Are we in control? Or an auditor starts asking questions, which may, may raise some uncertainties on your end, right? Yeah. So, uh... so how are you actually monitor? How do you know you're actually monitoring what you expect to be monitoring? Yeah. So, so what are all the problems that that could happen that uh, could could happen to a detection program, right? Um, especially since environments uh, are, are are always under constant change. Um, how do you know if the your event pipeline is working? Um, I'm sure many of you will relate to something in a scenario like this, where you are starting a new uh, threat hunt for a particular hypothesis, or maybe your team is investigating a particular uh, alert that is taking you to look at some logs, and all of a sudden you realize that you don't, your firewall logs stopped sending events you know, 30 days before. I'm sure many of you have experienced that. Um, and so many things could, could be wrong with that, right? It, it, it could be a licensing issue, it could be a network issue, so many things. Um, Another example that I'm sure a lot of you uh, can relate to is uh, like what a GPO management means in an enterprise environment. You know, it's a, it can be really cumbersome, right? There's so many GPOs for all these different sites and OUs and, and companies. Uh, and so what if, what if on one of your changes, someone um, overwrites a GPO that is defining your advanced audit policy and you stop getting your Sysmon event one event or Sysmon events in general in that small part of the network where an attacker may be hiding, right? Um, or another example, you've, maybe you did a red team engagement with an awesome consulting company. They show you all these awesome ways that they can execute Kerberos in attack. And as part of your uh, assessment, you create a detection to detect this. Great. Fast forward. Three months later, is that logic still working? Uh, what if what if something changed or on your analytics engine, maybe the schema changed and now you're looking for a field name that is no longer the right one? What if that complex detection logic just stopped working? How do you know that? On from there, so so let's say you, you don't have your own detection capability and you outsource this to a, to a, a very nice vendor that promise to take care of you, monitor everything. Uh, but how do you actually know that they are, that they're actually monitoring the right things and responding in the right way? I mean, they can, they can, maybe they pop up an alert and they don't know much about your environment. They assume it's fine and they basically close it as a false positive while it might have actually been a true positive and you might actually be already hacked. Um, and, and from that end, your stakeholders, uh, which might be uh, your CFO or your your internal audit or or whoever it might be on your end, uh, how do you, how do you convince them that you're actually in control? You you do have a lot of detection rules and you do have a lot of incidents, but is this everything? And is 
uh, how, how can they measure if you're doing well or not? And from a detection perspective as well. So how do you know your detection is actually Brazilian? You do have a lot of really good detection rules, but do they cover variants? Do they cover only the one that you read up on? Or do they cover a multitude of ways of executing that? Uh, so, yeah. you, so you need a way to, to measure this. Which comes to our uh, very uh, uh, graphic approach. Uh, so, so in the in the center, there's a couple of pillars, and the risk uh, pro is and the controls one are probably the most well known ones, where risk is usually determined by the business, uh, which is augmented by threat intel, and then there might be some other uh, values that that uh, uh, come to a certain risk posture. And then there there are your controls. Uh, which are obviously your detections, your mitigations, your preventative measures, uh, your hardening baselines, and so forth. So these are usually based on a couple of reference models, like MITRE ATT&CK, of course, which we all love. Uh, there might be a kill chain involved. Uh, there might be some additional um, uh, frameworks in, in terms of uh, hardening your environment. And then there's the effect of this one that we actually want to add, add to this which will support the other ones by providing meaningful, valuable data that you can use for your management, for your auditing parties, but also for your self-management. So you can actually know how you're doing. So then it a little bit depends on, on what you want to do with these uh, pillars uh, in, in which team you're at. So if you're in the blue team on the risk side, um, um, there's the control effectiveness that you might want to report to your, to your regulatory parties. Um, and on the um, uh, red side, uh, the risk might give you a lot of um, input for advanced simulations that you want to execute. And these are usually manual and very creative exercises, but these require a lot of time and money and effort, and you can't do this on a continuous basis, right? So we need something else. Uh, and this is where the purple part on the right, on the effectiveness uh, side comes in. So, so you can do a, a normal, purple team, of course, which is red and blue joined together. Uh, it's usually based on a forecast or some hypotheses. And, and the outcome is usually a, a really good detection engineering effort where you start building all kinds of new awesome detections, um, which is great. And if you can do this, you should totally do this. But this is always limited by time and effort. And not everybody but you can do this, that you don't always have an internal red team, or you don't have the means to do this on a monthly basis because it's quite costly to get consultants uh, in in there every time. Um, so, so you need you need something else next to that, and and this is where the automated adversarial simulation comes in. Um, on top of the the building new detections, you also can can then augment that with all kinds of validations of all your controls. So you can do this on a continuous basis, and this is why we're here. Um, so it's built by red and blue together to get a maximum result on a continuous basis. This is why we're here, exactly. Um, so yeah, that takes us to to uh, our next um, section here, automated adversary simulation. We strongly believe that the challenges that we described, um, the potential issues that could be uh, could affect a detection program. Um, can be approached by deploying automatic, automated adversary simulation exercises on, on, on corporate environments. So in this section, uh, we would like to share with you what we call adversary simulation, how we understand it, um, automated adversary simulation, uh, to be specific. Uh, I think it's important to say that, you know, we don't, we don't want to claim this term because automated adversary simulation could mean so many different things. Um, to, to different people, right? But in this section, we'll, we want to describe to you what we, uh, how we understand uh, this concept. Um, so basically, automated, automated attack simulation, so adversary simulation is uh, an automated activity that has two sides, right? We're running simulations, and then we are validating that uh, that the this uh, the, the controls that we have previously deployed in terms of detection or maybe even prevention controls um, are working as expected, right? They're passing they're passing the test, they're passing the simulation test. Um, the cha um, the challenge, as 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 um, Olaf was saying, or oh, purple teaming is great, right? But 
um, we we cannot execute purple team exercises with uh, you know fifteen ten people in a room, you know every week, right? How many times can you do it a year? Every every quarter, um, maybe every month, but not many organizations uh, have access to high skilled uh, red teamers that uh, can um, execute these techniques. Um, and um, it's basically also a snapshot in time. When we're doing a purple team exercise, it's just you're looking at it at a snapshot in time. But with automated adversary simulation, we can continuously check if those controls are working. It's basically also a, a way of generating telemetry, right? And we use this, just this telemetry to validate the environment, to validate the health of a detection program on a continuous basis, as all of us say. Um, so with, with this type of program, we can go over all the challenges that we described a few slides before. We can identify issues with the event pipeline. We can identify gaps in visibility, those misconfigure uh, GPOs, missing some events. Uh, if we're running simulation um, exercises against those endpoints, we, we will know that the events are missing, that we have a gap, right? So, and what is it not? It's definitely not a red team replacement. So it is, this is really not a threat to any of your red team or friends or, or if you're a red team are welcome. Uh, so, so it, this is really, uh, uh, you, you do need red team input if you can get it because they usually have better techniques than, than what you can build yourself. Uh, so it's, it's also not a pen testing, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, engagement either. It is, it is really meant to be a continuous validation or improvement phase. And it's, it's of course also not Skynet, it won't take over your company. Uh, and from that same aspect, it's not impacting continuity by design. So it shouldn't, it shouldn't break your systems unless you really, really want it to. Um, and, and from that perspective, it should be run in production, of course. Um, and it's also not the new holy grail or, or the new buzzword that you should hear at RSA next year, but it should be something that you definitely would need to be considering um, uh, to, in order to be really strong. And, and, and go, moving on from, from what I meant before, so you're not just running uh, Benjamin Delphi's tools in your production environment, right? You need some, for, some form of methodology to properly execute these. Uh, so of course there is some governance involved. You need to establish a sort of white team, depending on how intrusive you want your tests to be. Uh, you need to set some ground rules. There need to be some escalation path in, in, in case something actually goes wrong. You need involvement from IT ops because they might need to uh, accommodate some, some access to you or give you some means to, uh, to take some, some steps. Of course, you need a reference framework from that perspective as well. Of course, MITRE ATT&CK is, is there again, uh, but there might be uh, some PCI uh, uh, controls that you want testing or COBIT or HIPAA or, or whatever other fancy acronym out there. Uh, you need to have some, some frameworks that, that can actually measure what you want to uh, uh, prove. Um, and then the, the, we move a little bit more towards the execution part. So, so we need to have a scope. Um, and this, this, this scope selection phase uh, has two, cr two crucial points uh, that need to be in there. So you need to know which systems, uh, and as this can be, of course, which uh, in an office in Singapore or the US, uh, it can be workstation servers, well, you, you can figure that out. And then, of course, you also need to validate uh, or to set uh, the scope for which controls you want to test So, uh, or or to avoid from that, sense, from that end. So if you do know that you want to test A, B, and C, but you don't want to hit another one because then it might raise too many incidents or, or that system might be more volatile, uh, you need to be aware of that. Um, and from from these from these uh, uh, scope sessions, uh, you can actually start designing a campaign. Um, and this in this phase, you actually build the required objectives uh, or techniques that you want to execute. Um, and you add them to a, to a playbook or a runbook or a campaign design or however you want to call it. Uh, you test it, of course, first, um, and then you run it in production, obviously. Um, 
and and one of the steps in here also is defining the cadence uh, of testing so do you want to do this hourly daily monthly uh, whatever whatever your preference is and the timing between all these techniques so do you want to run it within i don't know 10 minutes do you want it to, it to take an hour and uh, this this can also impact your your detection rules right so so you need to vary this a little bit on and off uh, uh, whenever you do this and then of course you need to report uh, and validate all all, your, all of your outcomes. So uh, you want to know which test you ran. You want to know the results of each individual test, whether it was successful or not. Uh, you want to know the commands that were executed or the tools that were launched or all the all the, the relevant information that the blue team needs, including the time that it actually happened. If they didn't detect it, they need to be improving their detection. So they need this data. And of course, ideally, you also want to have your your alerts or your incident tickets or, or all kinds of telemetry that you can combine in the report where you can show the, the full end-to-end -end cycle where you executed something, uh, you did you did detect it, and it was actually also picked up by the by the team uh, uh, properly or not. Uh, so so whether they they actually uh, flagged it as a true positive is also a very important measure. Yeah, I want to follow up on the scoping piece that you were mentioning because I feel when when um, executing purple team exercises, the we really need to think about you know which parts of our network are targeting because you're always running exercises or on the same parts of the network. You know, again, we're we're gonna go back to the same issue as before. How do you know if things are working end to end across your environment, right? So there's there needs to be some a little bit of randomness on on that uh, scoping as well. Yeah, you should also start thinking about how do I integrate this into my detection engineering process. And this slide has been shown in multiple variants. I think the first one was was built by uh, Jared Atkinson uh, over at SpectreOps, and it's a really really nice uh, flow of building detection uh, 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 new detection rules. And I I only highlighted a few a few of the steps that that are interesting for for our our current talk. But of course, you need to be uh, working on all these steps that you can now probably hardly read by intention. Uh, but in the first phase, when you start thinking of, okay, what do, do I actually want to add as a detection? You're already looking at threat intel, industry reports. Uh, you might also uh, have your internal red team or an external red team that you can consult. So how can I execute this stuff? Um, and in the next phase, you when you start investigating, you um, you want to investigate as much ways of executing that that specific technique that you want to detect, um, and you also will want to be starting uh, to to develop scripts that you can then use in a later phase uh, to validate all of the detections that you are trying to build in the first place, so that you already think a little bit about how do I repeat this process later on. And this is also where you start uh, uh, implementing it in in, the, in phase four, when you when you are building your detection rule and actually starting to implement it in production. You also want to start implementing this, these validation scripts or tools or, or or whatever you've created into the same process, so that you can you can actually already from the minute it goes live start measuring its efficiency whether it's working correctly, whether um, um, your ex the, the outcome is actually as you expect it to be. And this is, of course, a, a, a delicate process where you don't want to be creating detections only tailored to your own validation script. So also these validation scripts need to be maintained. They need to be expanded. Uh, you need to uh, keep on researching whether, whether uh, it's resilient enough, of course. Yeah, ultimately, ultimately, the as as you, as we are creating detections, each one of them should should have uh, its own unit test, right? Uh, we see detection as a as an engineering process. We just need to test each one of our products. And one big requirement uh, for us is we believe that it needs to be end to end. Um, and I think there's also something to bring up here where uh, some challenges with other approaches um, 
where I would like to uh, differentiate between unit testing and functional testing, where um, in unit testing, you can perhaps inject um, a, a, to the event pipeline a particular uh, a telemetry, maybe generated by the execution of uh, adversary techniques to test the detection logic. And that's great. We should do that uh, to test the detection logic. But uh, that misses a point because you're assuming that uh, the event pipeline is working as expected. So I think we need to complement this type of testing with uh, functional testing, end-to-end -end testing uh, a technique on a specific host so that you're only testing the engine, but you're testing the data source uh, generating telemetry. So it's proper configuration. The data event being sent to through the event pipeline uh, through the analytics engine and ultimately generating um, that detection. So um, it needs to be end-to-end, -end, right, Olaf? Definitely, yeah. And and to the last two words in the sentence, it needs to be also in production, because I've seen I've seen labs and acceptance environments, um, and they, in my in my uh, long ex experience as a consultant it's never been really lifelike it can be close but it's only on on uh, maybe a handful of clients i've been to where acceptance actually comes close to production but still production is always different and this is the stuff that you're trying to protect right so why would you be executing all this stuff in a lab and then hope it works in production you need to make sure So what are some of the requirements if you want to run um, an automated adversary simulation uh, exercise? I think similar to a purple team exercise, in this case, I think the requirements are similar. Uh, you know, you need a defensive capability. It doesn't have to be, you know, uh, cutting edge, you know, like with the whole visibility and hundreds of detections. You can, you can have... Uh, Let's mature and it still, it will help to test the controls that you have in place. Of course, you have to tailor the simulation exercise to the controls that you have in place, but you need to have some kind of visibility in a detection program, right? Otherwise, you, you, don't, you don't know which controls to, te controls to test. Um, ideally, and definitely, we need some knowledge of the threats that we are executing, right? So this is, again, where the purple comes in on, on the talk, right? So we as detection engineers, as detection uh, um, as a detection team, we need to be aware of these techniques, maybe not uh, to the level that the red teamer does and execute them uh, like a red teamer does, but at least to, to the point where we can simulate them and confirm that uh, our logic is working, our assessing our programs are working. Um, and of course, we need tools right to to simulate this like the, we cannot be just downloading a, a a vm and 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 maintaining hundreds of, of different tools to execute all these uh, techniques uh, ultim uh ideally we need one tool or a set of tools that will give us the most uh, scope as possible in executing these techniques. And these tools need to have certain features and capabilities right they need to be able to be automated um they need to uh generate logs, um, specific logs um, to under, to be able to compare the execution of techniques with the detection controls that are uh, triggering, right? Um, so tooling is, is really important and we'll talk about that uh, on, on our next section. And it also it requires that you have a sort of an adversarial mindset. You need to uh, not only think about how do I defend uh, this stuff, but also how can, how can my company be attacked? And this is sometimes it's a little bit hard. So this is also where tools might actually help you a little bit, but you need to be a little bit aware of what can be done in my, in my environment, what can be done. And then all of these things need to be validated, of course. Um, and in order to do this, usually in, in a more... A uh, normal organization, you actually need some management buy-in because they need to uh, approve you spending time on this since it will cost a little bit of money. And if you want to buy uh, uh, one of the commercial tools, you, of course, need some some more budget. Um, and, and if you're a little bit bold, uh, as I've done in the past as well, you can also just do it and maybe say sorry later if they if they get upset. Uh, the, the, the big upside to this, if they don't really understand the value of, of a program like this, is that you can immediately prove them uh, 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 the results with, with, some, with some more details. 
but frankly, every type of management should should be interested in this, whether whether they're uh, uh, very financially focused or not, because this will this will give you a lot of insight into how you're actually doing as a as a team. And of course, if you if you have a, a security vendor that that does monitoring for you, you need their involvement as well, because otherwise you'll spoil uh, a good relationship and, and you need to actually be working together since they're doing part of your detection work. Yeah, so uh, let's talk about a little bit about, about the tools that um, are out there that can help us on an executing uh, automated adversary simulation exercises. Uh, so there's definitely a lot of tools uh, out there, right? We're not we're not inventing the reinventing the wheel here, really. Um, um, there's commercial tools. Uh, there's some open source tools. We're we're gonna stay away from the commercial tools since that's not our, our focus today. Uh, but um, let me tell you a little bit about my experience. So um, when we first started executing purple team exercises internally. Uh, our natural uh, uh, approach was to use red team tools, right? Tools like uh, uh, red team tools, uh, like uh, Metasploit, Empire, Parch C2. Um, and then they started validating uh, controls, which worked great at the beginning uh, when we were more on the form of like a manual purple team exercise where, you know, maybe once a week we check a particular technique manually. But that soon st stopped, be, uh, stopped being practical because as the number of detection grows um, and as our testing uh, moves to a weekly cadence, we cannot really, it's not practical to have an, an engineer just getting all these shells from your C2s and then start running things manually. Now, some of these tools do have APIs and there's actually uh, uh, adversary simulation tools that leverage the APIs, so they can definitely be used. Um, um, then some of these tools are also fully automated and allow you to create a stand-up uh, infrastructure in an automated way where you can run simulations uh, and, and hopefully your endpoint controls will, will catch them, right? But I, I think a big challenge with that is that you are running these simulations from fixed infrastructure, you know? from the same host every time. And that takes me back to end-to-end, -to -end, right? Because so with this type of um, exercise, you are not really confirming if your event pipeline is working or not. You're just confirming if that host, which is like built for that, is generating the telemetry and if your detection is triggering. So they're great. These tools are great, but they they have some some limitations. Um, ultimately, like I, I think some of these tools have been built to be run manually, uh, right, on a host, like on the screen, interactively. And that's fine, like they still have a value, but some of them are not really, have not really been built uh, for automation. And the ones that do actually have some complicated ways of building scenarios or adding new techniques, it's not, it's not always easy. And it's also the drawback with open source, probably also with my own tools, where, where somebody has a certain way of working in mind, it works for them. But for, for a new adopter, it's actually quite hard to start working with it. Um, and from a detection perspective, uh, not all the, these tools have a really uh, verbose way of, of telling you what, what happened, when, ha when it happened, and how, and so on. So the, the output is quite limited, which is hard then to match against your detections or, or, or it put into a, a more measurement program. Um, and as as Mauricio mentioned, some of them are very static in in terms of where they run from, or they're not as realistic, where it's just a bunch of Python scripts which are useful, but it it also is not always the way that an attacker would do it. So how realistic is it for a SOC then to be responding to this? Um, and lastly, not not all of them are uh, capable of doing stuff remotely. So it's usually from that same system they do something on that system, and then that's that which is also not always the way an attacker would work, of course. Yep, so which takes us to our tooling, right? So having uh, um, having mentioned all these challenges and the approach, uh, we, uh, we, Olaf and I have both built tools um, that uh, um, have different uh, goals. And uh, we've uh, 
integrate them to to execute a, a, a POC for automated adversary simulation. So we, we want to share uh, some of our tool, uh, these tools uh, in the next section. So so I'll start on mine. Um, so actually yesterday at, uh, at Black Hat Arsenal, I released uh, my adversary simulation tool uh, called Purple Sharp. So you can go to the GitHub page and you'll find all the information you need. But basically, Purple Sharp is a, a tool in C Sharp uh, that executes um, adversary techniques within Windows AD environments. So it's focused for AD environments. Um, it, uh, it follows the MITRE ATT&CK framework uh, as far as the techniques. Um, and the main goal of Purple Sharp is to help us execute some of these simulations to generate the telemetry uh, that can help us build, test, and hence detection controls, right? That's what it does basically, just execute techniques and will generate telemetry. And so if you have a, pro a properly monitored Windows environment, Windows domain environment, this telemetry will makes it, it gets, make its way to the event pipeline, to your analytics engine. And if you have coverage for the techniques that Purple Shell supports, you should validate your controls, right? Um, so uh, what are some of the, why Purple Sharp? Why is it different? Like we've talked about some of the tools that exist already. So I want to mention a few points real quick. I know we are uh, not great on time, Olaf, so I'll, I'll go fast. Uh, simplicity, um, it's one simple .NET binary. All you need is to compile a .NET binary and you can choose grab it and, and copy it to a Windows endpoint uh, and run simulations against remote hosts from that really easy. No C2, no C2 channels, no infrastructure, no VMs, one binary. Uh, verbose logging, as, 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 uh, as uh, Olaf was saying, we need uh, the audit trail of all these techniques that executed at what point, from which processes, from which process ID, so we can grab that data. And maybe if our detection controls didn't trigger, we can at least find that telemetry and create a new detection or identify why the detection didn't trigger, right? Uh, remote simulations. Purple Sharp is actually able to execute simulations or uh, what I want to call deploy simulations on remote endpoints. So once again, um, the challenge of verifying that the event pipeline is working or not can be easily approached with Purple Sharp. All you have to do is point your simulation to a host in your Singapore office and you'll confirm if that simulation will be detected as good as the one that in your, you know, headquarters, right? Uh, credible simulations. Uh, I've, uh, I used a couple of techniques with Purple Sharp to make sure that the simulation is credible. I'll mention a couple of things. Uh, you can go through the documentation to really understand, but one is uh, process uh, ID, parent process ID spoofing, PPID spoofing technique. I use this technique to be able to deploy simulations on remote endpoints and run the simulations under the context of the user who's logged in on that host at that point, right? So no longer we have to run simulations from that same infrastructure, from that same user that our SOC already knows, and it's just gonna close that alert, uh, and you're not really gonna train them unless these simulations run from real users on real computers. Um, Random names. Uh, Purple Server will leverage simple LDAP queries to query your environment and pick random hosts for the simulations. Um, to, for example, on a password spray attack, it's gonna pick random users. If it's gonna do a network share enumeration, it's gonna pick random hosts. So that randomness, once again, gives us that end-to-end -end testing. Attack variations, the last one, one really important for me is what Olaf was saying before, how do you know if your detection is resilient to a different way of executing the same, same attack technique? Um, well, I've tried to execute the same technique in, in, in a couple of ways at least. For example, a simple example is running PowerShell, calling PowerShell.exe, or running it from .NET using system automation uh, management, DLL. So one simple example, Purple Serp can execute both uh, for, that, for that technique. Um, Real quick, uh, the architecture, uh, Purple Sharp consists on three modules, the orchestrator, the scout, and the simulator. The orchestrator will run on the operator endpoint, uh, and it, the, the role of the orchestrator is to interact with the simulation target uh, to deploy the simulation. The scout will run 
on the simulation target and the role of the scout is just to obtain information about that host. For example, which is, who's the user that's logged in? Well, what's the process ID of explorer.exe so we can use the parent process um, uh, spoofing technique, uh, parent process ID spoofing technique. And the simulator, it run, just runs the simulation. So these two modules actually communicate with each other uh, using name pipes so that they can orchestrate the simulation. Again, if you want to learn more about this, go to the documentation. Uh, but at a high level, this is how Purple Sharp works. It's going to first upload, uh, once you point it to a remote endpoint, it's going to upload uh, the scout or using SMB. It's going to execute it using WMI. Then the scout service starts on the remote endpoint, and there's some communication on, on, on name pipes. That's where the or orchestrator instructs the scout to run a recon on this host, and that's where we find out who's the user that's logged in. Based on this information, the orchestrator will actually upload the simulator under the path of that user so that our simulation runs under the path of a real user and a real computer. Once again, credible simulations. Um, and once the simulator has been uploaded, the orchestrator triggers the simulation and the scout will execute the simulator using parent process ID spoofing. That way, the simulator runs under the context of the user and also as a child process of explorer.exe once again, making the simulation credible. This is just one example of a attack variation. As I was saying, I can execute a PowerShell just calling a create process API, calling PowerShell.exe, which, you know, could, could I could detect if I have some kind of EDR or this event ID uh, being uh, logged. But on the second technique, we're using .NET. Um, so your EDR or your Sysmon uh, or your event 4688 will not detect that, but you need to have PowerShell login enabled to detect that. So once again, how resilient is your PowerShell detection technique, right? Um, so I'm going to, we don't have time, so I'm not going to mention the, the other variations. Go ahead, Olaf. All right, so a nice build, uh, uh, an, an app for Splunk, which is called Threat Hunting, not the best name, but it's very uh, descriptive at least. Um, and it's a very graphically oriented tool that will uh, run about, I think, 160 uh, uh, hunts or, or queries or triggers, as you want to call it, throughout your environment on a, on a periodic basis. And it will give you a lot of telemetry, which you can then start using for, for either proving your detections worked, uh, so hunting, of course, which is the main intention of the tool. But it can also provide you with a lot of visibility into uh, all of the um, uh, triggers that have been going on. Um, thanks. Um, so there's a lot of detections for all kinds of techniques on Windows. Uh, it primarily utilizes Sysmon and the Windows native event logs uh, right now. Uh, it's heavily MITRE attack focused uh, because this is a framework that I really uh, embraced. Um, and and the, the primary goal was to provide an investigative workflow for, for hunters, but also uh, for, for detection engineers to provide as much context as possible that is all related to the same event without having to click and, and copy paste uh, a lot of times. So it's, it's, it's meant as an efficient way of going through your data uh, uh, based on triggers. So the POC that we want to show you today is basically how we've integrated both our tools to use Purple Sharp as a simulation engine and the threat hunting app as a detection engine so we can validate that these detections are being picked. So now we move to the demos, the fun part, guys. You must be bored about us talking. So uh, this is going to be the fun part. So in the first demo, we'll, uh, we'll execute a, a couple of three execution uh, the execution tactic, MITRE tactic execution, uh, three techniques, PowerShell, Windows Command Shell, and JScript. Uh, these are common techniques. If you read uh, most of the malware reports, you probably see that uh, malware, some in, always, or most likely will use some of these techniques. Uh, so uh, we'll move to the first demo, um, and hopefully this works. Um, okay. Oh. Oh. All right, uh, let me see if I can one do full screen. Uh, one second, of course, 
doing life, it's always uh, If you uh, go out of full screen on the browser first, let's do that. Thank you, Olaf. All right, there you go. <laughs> all right. So on this first demo, um, we uh, we have uh, one endpoint, two endpoints. Oh, let me go back real quick. Two endpoints. We have PC Sam, where we're gonna run Purple Sharp from, and we have another computer called PC Judy, where we're gonna run the simulation against. Okay. Um, all right, so we're going to use Purple Sharp command line in this case. In this case, we're going to, uh, if you want to learn more about the parameters, please go to the documentation. But basically, we're using, we're running a simulation against PC Judy using a service account that needs to be an admin on PC Judy. And we're going to run these three, three, uh, three techniques, and we're going to slip five seconds between the execution of each one of these techniques. Um, so we're going to pass the password of this service account that we're going to use to run the simulations against this host. Um, so we see here um, that uh, the scout gets up uploaded, recon happens, and we identify that Judy Brody is logged in on this host. So now this, the simulator is uploaded to a path within the user's profile, looking at, making it look as if Judy downloaded a fake Firefox installer. Then the simulation runs using parent process ID spoofing, so making Firefox installer a child process of Explorer rather than running under the context of UDI. And as I was going, uh, as I was mentioned before, this is the report that we get back. So we see all the details of when it ran, which technique, again, from which process ID, from which path, what which command was executed. In this case, we have a parser command. We have CMD, who am I, a simple uh, who am I, and then we, we execute what looks to be a malicious J script file. And all of them in the context of Judy, and then the uh, Purple Share will delete some of these logs files. So now we go to our uh, Splunk environment to confirm um, these, te these techniques were executed. Um, and as we can see here, we, uh, we see uh, the scout running. Right under the context of uh, the P# -sharp service account and as a child process of w WMI PRVSE, and then we see uh, the simulator now this time running on the context of Explorer and running under the context uh, sorry as a child process of Explorer and running on the context of Judy, so the real user who's logged in on that host, and then PowerShell is run, who am I is run, and this suspicious W script. Um, J script uh, script is executed, right? Um, and if we go to the 4104 uh, PowerShell um, events, we can see how the the script was actually just a sleep, 20 second sleep, right? So we, as a simple test, we confirm that this simulation run three techniques remotely, really easy with one command. We can run with Purple Sharp. Um, we'll go to the next one real quick. Quick, uh, let's see. I'm just gonna fast forward because of time here. Uh, we're gonna execute a different technique. Um, I honestly forgot what this technique is. <laughs> I don't speak uh, attack, but uh, but uh, we'll see what it is. I forgot. Uh, so follow the same process. I'm just gonna fast forward real quick. Uh, okay, yes. In this case, it's actually the same technique, PowerShell but this time running using system management automation, right? Uh, so a different way of executing PowerShell. We're no longer using uh, PowerShell.exe, right? So if we see on the logs, uh, we now, uh, we don't see PowerShell running. All we see is Firefox installer because Firefox installer, the simulator executed um, uh, PowerShell with .NET. But if we look at, uh, event ID uh, of module loads. I forgot what the event ID of that on Sysmon is, but we see the system management automation DLL being loaded by the simulator. So that's how we can catch that this guy is executing PowerShell techniques, right? So this is our first demo, really uh, first way of just running simple, a couple of simulations. Um, so on the next demo, we'll run um, a few techniques on the persistent tactic. Uh, we're going to use some registry keys. 
schedule task. We're gonna on defensive agent. We're gonna use portable execution. Uh, por sorry, portable executable injection. So PE injection, um, and then we're gonna dump Elsas using Purple Sharp. So Olaf will take you on this demo. Right, and we introduce some new stuff here. So there, there's, as, as you can see, there's this JSON structure, which is called the Playbook JSON structure, uh, um, and where you can define all the variants that you want to do. So here is where you schedule your your scenarios, basically. And you need to define some some basic stuff. So username, domain, the domain controller, the sleep between all the techniques uh, or the play the small playbooks that you want to execute, and then the playbooks themselves. Uh, so so you of course give them a name. You give them a host that you want to target. So it can either be a host name or a random host. And then as, as Mauricio explained, it will do an LDAP query uh, and find one itself. Uh, you can you can here also define the, the, the path uh, of the scout and the simulator where you want to be running it from. So you can actually make it even more realistic. Uh, the PB sleep is the, the sleep between these playbook steps. So yeah, the, these two techniques for, for the registry uh, uh, and the scheduled tasks, um, they will be run 30 seconds uh, in between. And then the next playbook will start after the playbook sleep. Uh, so, so, and, and over here, you can do the same thing. So, uh, the command line is, is a little bit easier here where you just say PB for the playbook and the playbook name, and you basically run it from there. Once you, of course, provide a password, you could do this on the command line, but I would advise against that, if, uh, especially on a demo environment. Um, so here it will show you that it will execute three playbooks and it will start with the first one. It first does an LDAP query to find the targets that it can run it against. It picked a random one. It, in this case, it's PC Judy again, um, and it's executing all these techniques on that machine. And well, this takes a little bit of time, so we have to wait for for all the um, uh, techniques to be executed. And this is where where that uh, uh, pipe communication comes in. So it actually checks whether it it's done. And once it's done, it will also clean up after itself so that at least you won't lose any traces. All the binaries will be gone again uh, if, your, if your EDR didn't stop it already, of course, uh, which uh, is also a way of validating whether it worked or not. Um, and there you go. So, so they are executed. So you show it was started, uh, where it was started from. Uh, you see the key that was added to the registry. Um, it was successfully created, um, then it was deleted because you don't want it to be there and the simulation is finished. Same goes for, um, for, for this technique where you see a different path uh, and a different uh, parent, or this same parent process ID that it actually executed from. Uh, and you see the command that was executed uh, in, in, in full detail, which you can then also use in your detection later on to see whether you actually found it. And in the meantime, it's starting to execute another one um, on, on, the, on, a, on a different machine. This is the PCMP. It's a different simulator that you see running under a different user context. Um, um, and it's actually um, uh, opening or injecting into Notepad. So you see exactly what it did. So it does an open process for virtual alloc. Uh, then it writes to that process memory and creates a new thread uh, from that. Uh, from that uh, 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 notepad.xc. And then the last technique that we uh, mentioned was, was running LSAS, and you see that it actually uh, ran, it, it identified the LSAS process, it tried to obtain a handle, it called the, mimi, uh, the mini dump, uh, 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 it, it wrote it, it dumped it there, um, and it fortunately also deletes it because you don't want to, again, leave, leave stuff for real attackers. Um, and then when it's done, it actually writes a JSON file with all the results, which you can then easily import into your uh, analytics platform of choice, um, which uh, in our case uh, will be Splunk. Um, but you can see here that the playbook is there and then there's a results JSON, which once you format it, uh, it shows you all the stuff that we actually just saw on the timeline, but then in a nice JSON structure so that you can actually start uh, importing them, um, and and then from the perspective of time, we might want to scroll through a little bit. Uh, yeah, show. makes sense. So ideally, because this I'm... is the this is the integration, right? So this is where you ingest this 
into your other platform. So go right. ahead. Now. Exactly. So, so I created a small POC uh, uh, dashboard again, just to show what what kind of data is in there. So you can see that the the, the orchestrated PCs of Sam executed uh, uh, um, techniques, the techniques that you see on the right, uh, on the machines that were involved, um, and and you can show these over time. So if you if you do a longer playbook than I did, you will see actually a, a longer scope, of course. Uh, here you see the playbooks that were executed. Um, and if you know my threat hunting app, you can click on everything. So it's the same over here. So once you click on one of those uh, playbook names, you will get all the raw logs with all the details uh, in the panel below, uh, which will show you all the all the results that you also saw on the command line. So once you click it, it will actually change to uh, to the proper playbook. Um, and the same will go uh, uh, for all the other fields. So once you click on a on a MITRE technique ID that was that was tied to one of those techniques. Hey, the stream is paused. Oh, there we go. Um, it will take you to my threat hunting app and we'll do the, a direct query for uh, for that technique being executed. And you see that that also it was detected by uh, by the logic in my app, fortunately. And it will give you all the details that, that might help you uh, uh, contextualize it even more uh, once you start playing with the app. And the same, this you can the same can be done for for clicking on a machine, um, uh, which I don't do yet. But I'll show you the, the the raw logs first, where you can see all the results from all the techniques that were executed. So again, you can quickly spot that everything uh, was executed. So you see the uh, the scout being run. Uh, you see that then the WMI is being called. Uh, the process is being injected into and it starts executing the registry commands and so on. Um, and the same goes for, for the scheduled task logs, which isn't that properly formatted, thanks Microsoft, but uh, this is, is a, a quick POC. You can obviously uh, properly parse this uh, uh, neatly, but it's quite easy to spot that, that some of the bad stuff actually was executed here. Um, and I think we can fast forward again. Okay. So yeah, we're going to the third hunting app. Yeah, and this is the same. So once you would have clicked a machine, you would have actually seen all the techniques that were executed on uh, on that uh, system in the threat hunting app, uh, which will give you a huge panel with all uh, techniques, all the commands that were executed, all the parent processes, uh, process GUIDs from Sysmon perspective. Um, and it will try to to uh, at least map it to the proper uh, uh, MITRE tactics as well uh, uh, as much as possible. Um, and here you can see that there were some DLLs loaded, there was some registry activity, uh, and you still have access to all the raw data as well. And that concludes the demo two. Okay, cool. Demo two. Um, let's move on. Okay, so we'll I'll do this real quick. Uh, of course, uh, Attack MITRE framework is our framework of choosing, and Purple Sharp uh, does integrate with uh, the Attack Navigator to visualize these techniques. So, with simply running just Navigator export, Purple Sharp will, will create a, navi a Navigator layer that you can open up and upload to the Navigator. Um, I'm gonna fast forward here so that uh, we make it on time. Just upload that, and you'll see visually. Uh, all the techniques that uh, Purple Sharp supports, um, so you can use it to pick the techniques that maybe you want to simulate on your automated uh, adversary simulation uh, exercise. And in a similar way, I actually support importing a navigator layer. So in this case, I'm going to uh, get a layer for APT, I think, 29. Uh, I, oh, sorry, Fin7. Yeah, I pick Fin7 uh, on the on Navigator, I export that layer to a JSON file. So I'm going to fast forward here. And then I move it to the folder where Purple Sharp is. And now in this case, I'm just going to import that Navigator layer. And Purple Sharp will analyze the technique that it does support and it doesn't support. So it'll, it will let you know. But then it finally creates, uh, in this case, it supports 17 techniques out of 29. And it's going to create a JSON playbook like the one Olaf just run on demo number two. And now you have a simulation playbook uh, for Fin7 that you can run on your remote endpoints, right? So, so pretty cool um, there.
Okay, so. Yeah, I think we only have one minute left, uh, Marisha, so we have to uh, publish this uh, just online, I guess. Yes, so, okay. Sorry. That, yeah, so w I've noticed on the, the Twitch that uh, some of the demos uh, we're not showing great, so right after this, I'm going to upload them on YouTube also, so uh, you see them. But the last demo, uh, yeah, it's also a cool one, but you'll, you'll see it on YouTube, okay? It'll be uploaded there. Uh, all right, you just want to take this last one, Olaf, since we're uh, running out of time. Yeah, sure. Uh, in the last couple of seconds, I just want to highlight that it, it, this is a huge value in terms of control, but also in terms of reportability and also ensuring that you're actually working on the right stuff. So it, it, it's also ease of mind, probably. So I, I strongly encourage everybody to just start with this. And especially since there's a bunch of open source tools out there, including ours, um, it doesn't have to be very expensive. So you can start small and then once you start maturing, you might want to look at a commercial tool or not. Um, and, and this should be really a nice way of implementing a way of testing all your detection engineering efforts. So you don't know, you actually know it's not in vain. You know it's actually doing something uh, because some of them probably won't trigger in production ever, hopefully, at least for you. Uh, so you at least know it still is working. Um, and it shouldn't be a grading mechanism for your team either. It can be used that way, but you should see it as a constructive tool and not as a sort of a slapping tool if you didn't do it well. Um, uh, and of course, if you don't have a detection yet, you can, of course, use it also uh, in, in a way of, of the purple exercise that we meant before, where you can start building new detections based on the techniques that we execute. But then make sure that you don't build tunnel vision detection. Make sure it's still resilient and it's open for, for variants. So thanks, everyone. Uh, that concludes our, our chat, our session today. Um, you have the links for our tools, and I'll also be uh, check out our Twitter. I'll also be releasing the links on the YouTube uh, videos for the demos so you can see that with a higher resolution there. But uh, yeah, thanks for coming to our session. I hope uh, you, you guys had fun, and uh, thank you. Thanks, guys. Girls. Thank you, uh, both of you. Uh, we, are, we really appreciate your uh, demo and your presentation. Um, as a reminder to everyone, we encourage everyone to join the Blue Team Discord and uh, head over to Text Talk Track 1, and uh, we can have the presenters answer some of your questions there as well. Um, right off the bat, I did see a couple questions, so if you don't, if you guys don't mind, uh, no, go right ahead. Okay, scroll up. Uh, the question was, what are some of the major benefits of Purple Sharp versus Atomic Red Team? Yeah, okay, that's a that's a great question. So I think there are different things. Atomic Red Team is more a way of describing how to execute the techniques um, and not really a, 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 an engine to execute the techniques themselves. Uh, although the Red Canary team is working on Invoke Atomic, which is a tool, a PowerShell tool that will be able to execute Atomic Red um, files. Uh, but if you ask me the difference between Invoke Atomic and Purple Shard, I would say um, running the simulations under the uh, context uh, in the context of a real user and as a child process of Explorer. So creating that credible simulation, that's something uh, Purple Shard can do. Another one is uh, randomness, being able to run um, a, a, a technique against a random host. Uh, to really identify if your detection controls are working end-to-end -end across your, uh, your environment. That's the second one. And I guess the third one would be just uh, simplicity. You, maybe you can have uh, a run simple binary that you can just copy uh, on, a, on a host and run simulations from. Very good. Uh, cool. Um, I think that's it for the questions for now. Uh, oh, here we go. Uh, did you guys teach a course on this during this week? 
No, we didn't. But maybe that's a good idea. Maybe we can do that on the next one, Olaf. Yeah, that will be fun. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Open to that. I know we fun. had fun doing the demos. So <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, too much. <laughs> yeah. Too much. Maybe uh, something in the future that you can do a workshop. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that's it uh, for this. And um, if you guys don't mind uh, sticking around for a little bit and yep. text, talk track one, sure. um, if people have questions. Yep. So one last thing is just I'll be posting the, the, the links of all the demos right after this. Uh, so check out our, our Twitter. Um, and uh, you'll be able to watch all the the third the third last demo, which was also really cool. We didn't get a chance to. Cool, very good. Thank you guys again. I appreciate it. Yeah, most welcome. We had fun.